All right, hello and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club. Uh, we are your hosts this evening. I'm Tobias Berblinger, and uh, this is Will Lacoma. Together, we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are all now members, provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex, Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. And now let's give a warm Curiosity Club welcome to Dave Selger. Great, good evening, thank you all for coming. My name is Dave Seliger and I'm a writer for Core 77. A special thanks to uh, Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club for hosting me this evening. So, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so just a few weeks ago, here I was at graduation, graduating from college. And just a few weeks from now, I'll be moving down to the big city. So I have a few months to play with my time and I decided to spend it somewhere a little less densely populated in the middle of the desert, driving cross country and back across the United States. Uh, right now, I've spent 6,000 miles on the road, three weeks on the road, uh, coming out of Boston, and I've another about 5,000 miles to go. So, in my travels and in my writing for Course 97, I've covered a variety of things, everything from products to buildings to pancakes shaped like footwear to uh, DJs, Batman, and boats. But a lot of the things that we cover on Core 77 come from either New York City, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland, and there's fantastic design there. You know, I googled uh, New York City on Core 77, got close to 80,000 hits. But for cities like New Orleans, Detroit, uh, you know, Las Vegas, Phoenix, we don't necessarily cover as much design out of those cities. So I decided to travel across America to a whole variety of cities, not just the big ones. Everything down the East Coast in places like D.C., uh, you know, Philadelphia, Charlotte, North Carolina, through the South, up through Texas, up the uh, West Coast, and then I'm going to be working my way back through the North. So I wanted to ask this question, what is design in America? When um, you know, a famous writer set out on the road with his dog and travels with Charlie, and he was asking the question, what is America all about today? So the question I've been asking for the past three weeks, and I'll be asking for another three weeks, is what is design in America all about? So on my travels, I've met with numerous firms and written up in articles on Core 77, but I thought tonight I'd spotlight uh, eight particular firms in various parts of America and explain a little bit about what these firms do. Some of them you might know, some of them you may never have heard of. And then also talk about their thoughts on design in America and where design is headed. So first up, we have Electronic Ink. So Electronic Ink is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Probably the best way I can sum up what they do is they take really, really boring computer systems and make them really sexy with design. So for instance, they took a 911 dispatch program. And as someone with a background in firefighting and disaster response, a lot of the technologies that we use are poorly, poorly designed. So here they're taking something and applying design for the first time in maybe 100 years making something that's usable and easy to use and you know, use for disaster response. So some of the things that came out of the conversations with Electronic Inc. is this idea about having intelligent conversations about design. This is maybe a little bit extreme, but I can have a more intelligent conversation about design with someone in Zurich, you know, an actuary in Zurich, than with someone here in the US. And some of the reasoning behind this is that design and education is, you know, it's not something that's always included. We always have math, we have science, we have writing and history, but you only ever touch design when you get up into college, maybe. If you go into design, if you go into engineering. So the fact that in places in Europe, you can have intelligent design, you know, intelligent design conversation with anyone is because they've had exposure to design in their life. Something else about, there's no design management background in a lot of the people that this company works with. So once again, they haven't had exposure to design, they've maybe, you know, maybe their idea of design is interior design, which is honestly a lot of the, uh, a lot of the sens sentiments that I've encountered on this road trip with non-designers. You know, what are you doing? I'm on a design road trip. 
oh, you write about interior design? Not exactly. And then lastly, it's what we do as humans. We design. Design is in every fiber of our being. You know, how, how you're sitting today with your, your, with your flannel shirt, that's designed. These chairs you're sitting on, those are designed by someone. So how can we better incorporate design into our lives and be aware of how each and every part is designed? So next up, I went down to Richmond, Virginia and visited the VCU Brand Center. So what they're doing is, this is a very innovative marketing school, communication school. When I first found this place, I was like, oh, they just teach people how to make McDonald's ads and Burger King ads. And I was kind of skeptical going into it. But I was pretty surprised to find out that what they're doing is they're trying to figure out ways to make you know, advertising and marketing a better part of your life, to make marketing enhance your life, not get in the way of it. You know, I drive down the road and I see billboards and you know, that's my idea of marketing. But how can we make marketing encourage you to buy better products to make your lives a little bit better? So something that, uh, that Berwin Hung talks about was this idea of creative technology. The best way I can describe this is they're kind of the design thinkers, the designers in the advertising agency. Whether it's you know, combining cameras with shoes to you know, create better experiences, new ways to experience marketing. Or being able to order pizza on your phone in three easy steps. So I really love this quote. And the Ziva guys will recognize something I said yesterday. But it's kind of like the Justice League. You know, Superman is the writer, but Batman is the creative technologist. He's the designer. You know, he's using all these tools, but at the end of the day, it's his brain and his thinking that separates him out from the rest. And more on that is that being creative means that you crave at everything. Just because you can design a building doesn't mean that that's the only thing you can do. Just because that you're good at designing cars, meaning that's where you're your creative talent ends. And then lastly, this idea about storytelling in design. You know, uh, marketing is about telling stories, encouraging you to buy products or encouraging you to learn more about companies, about firms. So how can you use storytelling combined with technology to create really engaging uh, you know, marketing platforms or technology platforms? Then I went down to Charlotte to visit the uh, AIGA and uh, three, three uh, designers in particular. Um, so first up, Matt Stevens did this great redesign of Dunkin' Donuts. Um, this was a personally driven project, and what he found is that we're, after working at a firm for about 10, 20 years, he was sick of those projects. The very first project he did for his own personal satisfaction was this, and since then he's gotten more engaging, better projects than he's ever had before. Uh, this is from David Sizemore, um, who's an illustrator and designer. And then lastly, from uh, Rachel Martin, um, who tries to work with good companies doing good things. She specifically doesn't work with the big corporate giants who are all based in Charlotte. Um, I think they include uh, you know, places like Lowe's. She goes out of her ways to work with good designers. And some of the things that came out of this were, uh, so Rachel Martin came out of New York City. And there, I mean, how many designers are in New York City? I'm moving to New York City. I'm just going to be another number in the hundreds of thousands of designers there, right? But in Charlotte, where there's a burgeoning design scene, she can actually stand out and make a mark. And then you have someone like Matt Stevens who goes to work for, uh, for Facebook on the West Coast. And there's so much talent there, you know, but it gets to the point where it's saturated with talent, where it's hard to stand out. On the one hand, it's good that it pushes you to do your best, but you can't always make your mark if you're you know, a big fish in a small pond versus a tiny, tiny, tiny fish in a huge pond. The next, that there's this idea of this stage that is the internet. Of course, the internet has been around for decades. I grew up with the internet. I never was alive before the internet. But it's still a developing organic thing. It allows you to do something local, do something small time, and then put it out for millions of people to see on the internet. I mean, you know, it, it's funny seeing who visits your website. Sometimes it's you know, people you might expect, people in the industry. Sometimes it's the government for whatever reason. And sometimes it's someone in China who just happens to be interested. You know, something that you're doing locally in your neighborhood is out there for all the world to see. And then lastly, this is probably one of the best quotes I encountered on this trip so far, is that you have people like architects who have a civic duty to influence the world and to design buildings and improve society. But at the same point, you have graphic designers who are influencing the world, you have product designers, you have footwear designers, you know. It's your duty as designers to make the world a slightly better place. 
So AI3 is a pretty innovative architecture firm down in Atlanta, and you'll see why in just a minute. But I think what's interesting about them is they're the first architecture firm I've ever encountered that uses kind of design thinking and those types of methodologies to come up with better ways to engage their clients. So this is actually an example of them running through uh, one of their uh, visualization sessions. So at the very beginning of all their projects, they sit all the clients down on these big comfy couches. They break out you know, the giant whiteboard and they throw up, what do we want to tell? What kind of story do we want to tell of our building? What do we want to show? It's not just let's build something that's going to end up in architecture record, right? It's let's build something that's for the clients. Does anyone want to get the door for this guy? Oh, so. Thank you. Cool. Sorry. <coughs> so this is, a, this is a burger joint that AI3 designed. It's called Flip. As you can see, everything is pretty much 180 on top of you know, the ground level. So a, ta you know, a table is flipped up above. On the far right, you can see the booths are actually flipped on top of one another. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool what they're doing. And then you have places like this. This is a super group. You walk in and you, you're convinced that you're on a Star Trek or Star Wars space station somewhere. You know, it's, it's amazing that they can get their clients to say, we actually want something that's a little bit, you know, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey or a little bit Star Wars. And that they can actually go out and build this. So a lot of the projects that AI3 does are all based in Atlanta. They're working locally. And something that they said is that working locally is more directly related to your actual life. You know, they took me on their tour of projects they've done in Atlanta, and we walked into Flip Burgers, we walked into the super group. To be able to do that with all your projects, that's a different type of connection you need your clients, as opposed to having to fly halfway around the world to see if everything's going right on a project in China or in Russia or in South America. And also, like I said, what story do we want to tell? We're building a building that's going to be around for you know, 10 years, 20 years. It's not just a building. It's a living thing that our clients inhabit. How can we tell stories with this space? And lastly, a little bit critical of the design industry. You know, a lot of the clients that they work with say, oh, so you're going to go design us a building and we'll come back in a few months. And if we don't like it, that's too bad. But, you know, you're the designer here. It's a different way of approaching and saying, no, it's... We're trying to engage the clients. It's a co-creation process. So how can we get the industry to change the public's perception of what design is all about? So Civic Center, some of you may have heard about down in uh, New Orleans. Um, they're, they're design activists. They're, they're pretty different than a lot of the people I've talked with. Uh, they start off doing projects like the street vendor diagram. So a lot of the rules are pretty banal in New York about you can only be, you know, no less than three feet from the curb or you need to have a permit to be a street vendor. So there's a way of taking this information and, you know, communicating it to different you know, people around the city. Instead of just having, you know, you be a street vendor for 10 years and never being able to share all this information that you've learned over you know, a decade of your life. And then they move on to more urban projects. So this one I really love. They put up these kind of name tags on dilapidated buildings around the city. Uh, New Orleans and Detroit, saying, you know, what do I wish this building was, this dilapidated supermarket? You know, I wish this was not my neighbor. I wish this was owned by someone who cared about the building. So, you know, something I talked about was this idea of the internet as a stage. But there's a flip side to it, you know. People think that if you retweet something about, you know, the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, you made a difference. You know, the flip side is that, no, I mean, just because you put something on Twitter, you put something on the internet, you might raise a little awareness to the you know, 100 people who follow you. But until you actually go down into the project areas and you work with the people who live there, you're really not going to make a difference. And then, you know, this idea of, you know, we're, we're all consumers. We love, you know, going to the store at 4.30 a.m. to get the best possible sale on Black Friday. But we're not always willing to sit down and talk about important things like, you know, our child's school or you know, the government, how the government runs taxes. Why, why is this such a difficult thing to have a conversation around? And then lastly, you know, once again, pretty critical. Um, you know, this idea about design is cloaked in academic terms. You know, a lot of the books that I try to take out of the library on design, you know, I'm a designer and I write about design. I can't get through these things. It's like 400 pages, you know, it's a brick. I don't understand what they're saying. Why can't we just have a simple conversation about our lives that are designed, you know, about buildings that are designed. 
you know, but more to the point that the word design is meaningless. It's become so ambiguous, you know, with design thinking and, you know, design methodologies and design this and design that. What has design lost? What is design really all about? Um, you know, as I moved my way through the South, I stopped off at John Colco's uh, Austin Center for Design. So this is kind of trying to disrupt education. It's mostly people who've already graduated from college and are looking for a new type of education. They're sick with, well, uh, I'll get back to that in a second, but uh, some of the projects that have come out of this is you know, social innovation. So looking at homeless people and how can you better engage homeless people to raise their personal value about themselves, to raise society's value about the homeless. Um, so there's a project called Our School which allows homeless people to teach classes in their community so that they feel like they're giving back to people. Then you have something like Pocket Hotline, which allows you to volunteer to be on a hotline for a homeless center. All you have to do is give your cell phone number and all the calls get forwarded to your cell phone. So pretty innovative projects coming from people who are sick of working you know, for big corporate design firms and want to find real problems on the street. So like I was about to say, I'm sick of designing more plastic crap for the world which sums up a lot of the sentiments I've come across in my trip. Um, and that instead of designing things, why don't we design things for people, services, uh, that people are the center of design, whether you're designing footwear or something else. You know, and then also this idea of going back to school. That, you know, I just graduated from college and yes, I did learn a lot, I made some great connections, but was it the education that looking back I really wanted? You know, maybe I wanted to do more hands-on projects. Maybe I wanted to work more with clients and with real people. You know, if I were to go back to school, I want to make sure I'm in a place that it's not just about getting that A, getting that GPA. It's about doing something good and learning good skills. And then lastly, you know, pretty uh, brusque quote, but people associate uncredited and informal education, which is what, you know, AC40 is, with being lazy and not rigorous. But at the same time, because it's not necessarily a set education, it's not a set kind of curriculum, it forces you to go out and learn whatever skills you need. So if you don't know how to code, it forces you to go out and learn how to code. If you don't know how to you know, pro, you know, rapid prototype, it forces you to go out and learn those skills. You know, as I moved back up the coast, I got to San Francisco and Artifact, which is a pretty cool design firm. So they had this thing called See What You Print. So it's a different way of engaging with technology. It removes all the thousands of interfaces between you and, say, printing a photo that you like. When I try to go print something, you know, you're constantly clicking like you know the down arrow or the, the black color arrow. These interfaces, you know, separate us or you know put a boundary between us and technology, us and products. So how can you remove that boundary? Then also, there's a product that uh, that Artifact just launched. So this is a product or a design consultancy firm which is now taking the next step into entrepreneurship. So something that I'm seeing a lot with design firms is that they're not just designing products for, for partners. They're you know, taking these ideas that you would usually throw out or you know, put on the, on the shelf for 10 years. They're taking these ideas and turning them into companies. So we start off, some, we start off a bit small, but we do a lot of learning and develop empathy for other disciplines. So the guys at, at Artifact are UX designers, but suddenly they're finding themselves becoming product designers and architects and apparel designers, because this is what they need to do in this developing world of design. And then uh, actually one of their new heads of, uh, of the San Francisco office, Robert Murdoch, who came out of Method, um, is reading this book about Bell Labs and he's seeing multidisciplinary design and engineering 50 years ago. Okay? This multidisciplinary design and engineering, this is not something new. But it's something that we're starting to rediscover and realize that, hey, this worked for us once. Why can't we put it into action again? And then lastly, uh, the word design stuck because it's locked up in these craft disciplines. Crafts like architecture is a very specific craft. You know, craft like product design is a specific craft. So how can we reframe design as just a word we throw, throw around and, you know, I do design, I do this design, do that design as... I do design to improve the world and to create enhancement of people's lives. And then lastly, Astro Studios over in San Francisco as well. These guys probably do the sexiest products I've ever seen in my life. So they did the boxy, which, okay, this isn't that sexy, but it's, it's a cool, clever you know, rethinking of, of a box to create something that, I mean, honestly, this really pops out and stands out as a product. 
but also these uh, the Soul Republic headphones, which I'm sure you've seen around on the streets. Um, you know, this isn't just this isn't just a product. They redid the brand. They redid the strategy. It's looking at design holistically. It's not just okay. We need you to design headphones for us. It's design headphones for us, and then design an image, design a, a culture, design ways for us to communicate with our clients. So we're looking for things that are new, not just new to people, but also that have relevance and meaning. You know, you're not just creating a pair of headphones. How is this something that you integrate into your life? Then lastly, design in America is whatever you want it to be. You know, are we consultants? Are we product designers? Are we architects, footwear designers? You know, it, it's constantly changing as design evolves. So I thought I'd kind of sum up all these trends that I found in kind of my seven or so steps of what is the future of design in America. And this isn't meant to be preachy as, you know, you know, I give you the steps and go forth and create design. It's just trying to give you an idea of, you know, what I'm seeing as I travel across America and what firms that you guys might not have a chance to check out are doing. And maybe it's something that you're doing in your own firm or you're seeing in your own life. So first up, whole list of words here. These are a lot of the, the terms I've seen along my trip. So product designer, graphic designer, service designer, interior designer. What do these all have in common? Anyone, please. Design. Yeah, they have the word design in there, exactly. You know, we've diversified our roles and our crafts to, you know, each day it feels like there's a new segment of design, whether it's footwear design or, you know, information design is one of the newest ones. But we start out with this word design and now we're kind of coming full circle to the point where we're getting back to, what are you, I'm a designer. You know, maybe I do products, maybe I do architect. But at the end of the day, you're a designer and you apply design values. You know, I kind of stole this off of Core 77's page, but these are the, uh, the stereotypes of designers. Are we just stereotypes of architects? Are we stereotypes of product designers? Or are we something else? Are we people who choose to apply design in our lives to our professions? You know, maybe you're a, a machinist. Do you apply design to machining? Does that make you a designer? But I really like this quote uh, from someone I met along the way, Florian Bulmer, that design is about design. It's not necessarily about a specific field of design. And that's more and more the most important thing of what I'm seeing, that design is just about design. So one way I like to think about design is that it's a nice power suit that you like to wear to enhance your capabilities. Without the person inside, and yes, this is from Elliot, but um, without the person inside, it's just a machine. It's, it's static, it's not moving. But as soon as you add the person into the machine, you add the person into the design, you're able to create these connections that make a product have life, that give life to that product. So one of the people that I interviewed you know, about a year ago were these DJs who were performing at my school called RAC. And they went out and they created this interface that allows them to better interact with their music through better touchscreen capabilities. So without the, you know, without the DJ, it's just an iPad with a piece of software on it. But if you add the person in, you're creating these connections that allows them to change the music and to create you know, musical scenes and a party scene or a dance party, right? So create connections with people. The value of a product is not in the product itself. It's in how the person uses it and the person. So going back a few thousand years or a few million years, um, we have these, you know, storytelling in caveman dwellings, right? And then nowadays, you know, a really big trend is comic books and graphic novels. This is uh, 99 Ways to Tell a Story by Matt Madden, which I highly suggest everyone checks out. He takes a, uh, a one-page story and tells it in 99 different ways. Okay. You know, some of them is just straightforward, some of them is a monologue, some of them are abstract and weird and wacky. But it's this idea that you can take a very simple message about going down to the kitchen to get a beer and retelling it in so many different ways that create different emotions and different experiences. So this is an example of poor storytelling that I learned about today at a pencil, uh, actually right over there, where Reebok took Kool-Aid and tried to create this weird interaction between, oh, you know, you're going down the street to get a Kool-Aid drink and you're wearing your Kool-Aid sneakers. Is that a story? I mean, yes, it has words and it has images and, you know, maybe you, you know, went down the street to get a Kool-Aid because you're wearing Kool-Aid sneakers. But it, it defeats the purpose of what storytelling is all about. It's about creating lasting moments of shared experiences, about your experiences with products, with services, with architecture, with the world around you. Because that's what you're going to remember 80 years from now when you're you know, in your nursing home 
Stories from your past. You're not going to remember that you wore Kool-Aid Reebok sneakers. At least I hope you won't. But this is an example of good storytelling. So this is in my hometown in Boston. This is the Holocaust Memorial right downtown. And it's very simple. It's three or four glass columns with the names of people who were killed in, engraved in the glass. It has kind of this smoke bubbling up from beneath. And it, it, it's very simple. You know, there, there aren't too many words. It's not, it's not plastered on it right away what this is all about. But it tells a very emotional story that as you move through, you learn a little bit about, about history and learn about yourself. So use design to tell stories and experience with a product or service is, is fleeting. But stories last forever. So this, this is a pet peeve. Okay, I was in San Francisco. I kept having to park on the street and do all these parking meters. And this is honestly the worst design product I've ever had to use. It stole so much money from me. I'm, it's, it's just terrible. I've never had luck with parking in San Francisco. It's just, no, no, it's, it's horrendous, right? So is this a good interaction with a product? Honestly, the only interaction that I got out of this was that I was cursing at this thing for about 20 minutes. <laughs> So this is a kind of a funny piece, but it's also very interesting. It's called Brief Rant on the Future of Interaction Design. Basically, the argument here is that, you know, so much of our technology is based on, you know, touch screens and tablets nowadays, but we were built with fingers that like to grab things and hold things. So why not design technology that leverages the capabilities that we were born with? So this just came out about a week ago, the Microsoft Surface. And my first instinct was, they put a keyboard on this thing? Aren't they kind of going back, you know, about two years? It's kind of a little bit retro almost. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized typing on an iPad is, next to using the, you know, the parking meters in San Francisco, typing on an iPad is the most frustrating thing in my life. You know, the buttons are too big. You don't really have any good feedback about the buttons as you touch them. So this, this to me is, is good design in the fact that it's leveraging capabilities that we have. It's creating connections. It's creating experiences. So... Focus on people, focus on fingers, focus on toes if you're a footwear designer. This means creating intuitive experiences and designing with emotions in mind. I do believe that emotion is not raging anger at a parking meter. It's, oh my God, I love using this parking meter so much. So this is also another interesting article. So can designers save the world without creating more stuff? That's a very important question right now. This goes back to someone from a Austin Center for Design. I'm sick of designing more plastic crap. You know, can we design a better world through the products we already have, through the services we already have, through careful tweaking, through careful use of design? I'm not going to say design thinking. You know, so this makes me think of family heirlooms, something you pass down, whether it's a family watch that, you know, your, your grandfather carried to America when he was an immigrant. Maybe it's, you know, a family photo. Maybe it's a car that your dad, you know, built in his garage and is passing down to you. So how do we create products that we want to pass down? So one of my favorite products that came out of Ziba actually is the TDK boombox. I absolutely love this boombox. If I own this boombox, and I don't, unfortunately, this is something I would pass down to my kids. You know, I'm probably not going to pass down my iPhone or my old iPod, but this is something worth passing down because it, it, it's emotional. It has interesting interactions, and it's just beautiful to behold. I don't want to see this end up in a landfill somewhere. So create meaning and value in the products and services you design. Create something timeless that's worth passing down to your kids and to your grandkids. So I've talked about the iPhone a lot. And usually when I talk about design or engineering with people, they say, oh, you mean like Apple. I'm so sick of hearing the word Apple, honestly. I mean, you know what? I'm using a MacBook and I have an iPhone right here. And honestly, I love Apple. Sorry, Apple. But it's annoying to me that this is what design has become all about. The Apple aesthetic, the Apple values, you know, all that this stuff. It's like saying that Frank Gehry is the only architect out there. You know, I used to be an architecture student. Someone would say, oh, you mean like Frank Gehry? No, not like Frank Gehry. That's not why I'm doing architecture right now. And something that I've mentioned a few times, but is design all about design thinking? Pretty much every designer that I've talked to on this trip has not mentioned the words design thinking once. And I thought that this road trip was gonna be called the design thinking road trip. So I'm very pleased that that was not the case. But right now I'm seeing a lot of designers moving away from design thinking that, oh, you know, it, it's, it's a great tool in some cases, but it's not the go-to thing. And yet when we talk about design with public, it's 
let's do a design thinking workshop to figure out the bugs in your government program or to figure out the bugs of your business. Design thinking should not be the end all be all of what design is about. How can we get back to what the root of design is, that multidisciplinary approach or the, the thinking approach, maybe without the design? You know, but this falls on the burden of, of the societies that you guys are part of, whether it's the AIGA, the IDSA, the AIA or the IXDA, that's a lot of A's. You know, it, it goes on. It's, you know, it, it falls on the burden of the society, it falls on the burden of you as a designer to say, design is about enhancing your life through, through footwear, through building, through products. You know, educate the public about design so that we can have intelligent conversation about design. Not just with an actuary in Zurich, but with the person sitting next to you, with the person sitting next to you on the bus, with your dad, with your mother, with your teacher. And then lastly, you know, this idea about you can design something and the whole idea is to get, you know, maybe global recognition. I mean, this is the new World Trade Center in New York City. You don't have to be the architect that designed this. You don't have to be the designer that designed something that gets a million dollars on Kickstarter. That doesn't have to be you. You know, this is Project H, which was uh, based down in North Carolina and has now moved to, uh, over to California. This is about as local as you can get. They took design methodologies to one of the poorest high schools and one of the poorest districts in America, and they're teaching kids to apply design. But a project like this gets global recognition. So it's a local project that's getting global recognition. What? Uh, it's a farmer's market. And then also something like something that came out of Civic Center. So a very locally based project. So this is called Before I Die. And it's pretty much a giant blackboard where you can write, Before I Die, I want to be a designer. I want to explore the world. But this is a very globally famous project, right? So work local, think global. You have a stage that's called the internet. So use it to your advantage. So to sum up everything we've talked about so far, design is about design. Find new ways to connect with people. Tell stories through your design, although not like the Reebok and uh, Kool-Aid story. Focus on people, not things. Create meaning and value, things that you want to pass down to your kids. Educate the public about designs so where we can have intelligent conversations. And then work local and think global. And then what I want to leave you with tonight is a quote uh, that comes from actually Rachel Martin from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina's website which is probably one of my favorite quotes from the trip, which is, design means being good, not just looking good. You have all these skill sets, so put them to work. So thank you. So we got time for questions, if, everyone, if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Um, I'm interested as into whether the things that you found when you're Yeah. from another part of the world, you know, I'm kind of interested in what it means to be from a nation and how that yeah. affects how you do things. And yeah, I think the honest answer is that I don't know how to answer that, yeah. you know, because this is the Design in America road trip. Um, but I think the important thing is that, you know, a lot of the big names in design, not all the names in design, but a lot of the big names come out of America, you know, whether it's Apple, whether it's, you know, um, you know, Frank Gehry or, you know, even IDEO, right? These are all based in America and seem to somehow define what design in America is all about for the larger worldview. But there's all these other firms doing all these amazing things. You're getting back to what the root of design is. So I don't think design is a, you know, is a American thing and it shouldn't be an American thing. But it's something that's not as integrated into our culture yet as in places like Europe, places in Asia, places in South America where Design is rooted in your education growing up. It's something you experience. It's something you live by. I think America needs to work a little bit better on integrating design from kindergarten all the way up, not just in college. I think you can get gorgeous what you need to do. Europe. I would love that. Yeah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Come on. Bad design. How do you handle that when you're on tour and you're, you're the guy who's around and seeing things? It's, it's awkward. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not so much bad design as it's people who are just repeating things that have already been done. So things like design thinking or like we do design research. 
I can't tell you how many times I heard those words, we do design research, and I had to listen to the whole process behind it. And I wasn't convinced that they actually go out and do that research. I mean, you know what, maybe they honestly do, but they're not paving the way to get to what design's all about. Design is something that's constantly changing and evolving, right? If you're just following what someone came up with 10 years ago, are you really pushing the limits and boundaries as a designer? So it's not so much things that are bad, it's things that have been proven time and time again. And I want to see something that's new, something that's evolving and changing. Um, so, I think design research is extremely important. I think it's something that people don't necessarily fully understand yet. That it's, people, people look at design research as the ideal way. You go out, you do the in-context interviews, you, know, you, you take tons of notes, you take photos, you come back and you put them on a whiteboard. That's great. You know, that, that works in some, some semblance, um, you know, in some situations. But I think there's different ways to stretch that and to do more, whether it's, you know, fully embedding yourself in that lifestyle, whether it's, um, you know, I mean, I don't have a good answer because I haven't thought of it yet. You know, it's still still changing. But I think people try to kind of can design research as this is how you go out and do research. I think there's too many ways to go about doing that. I mean, there's, you know, look at all the disciplines like anthropology, sociology, um, you know, engineering, design, uh, you know, studio art, all these different ways that have all these different disciplines that have different ways of doing research. I don't think there's one way, and yet everyone seems to think there's the five-step process to doing design research. Um, I think it's also about teaching designers to have those skills. That a lot of companies now kind of have the role of design researcher. Um, probably the most distinct one I've seen, though, is actually something from Ziva that I saw yesterday with uh, Chris Butler, who's sitting in the back row. Yeah, that's a little weird. Um, so his department actually uh, does a lot of research into trends and tracks trends over time. It's not just going out and saying, okay, we're doing a healthcare project. What does healthcare look like right now? It's, okay, we might be doing a healthcare project, we might be doing a new shoe, we might be doing a new store. Um, but we've been doing all this research for the past year, tracking culture, tracking politics, tracking news, tracking um, world events. How do these things all influence healthcare? How do these things influence um, you know, footwear and a new store? I think that's what research is, it's not just, um, well, I have a project, I'm going to do very specific research right here. It's about having a bigger worldview. So hopefully that answered it somewhat. Do you, did you have any experience with people that weren't necessarily, or maybe they were designers, but they were designers in the same company that produced the product, like, so that that whole process was like singular to that company, so that it was like, basically you had somebody who said, well, we got a lot of negative feedback, and then here's the guys who make it, and this is the problems they're having producing the product. So here's the compromise, guess what? We're all buddies and we're on the same yeah. floor. Here's the solution. Do you have yeah. I mean, did you so, write Yeah, so uh, probably the best example of that is uh, Toyota's design research shop, uh, Cal-T Design Research in outside LA. Um, and so obviously they're, they're all in one big company. Um, and right when I walked in the room, I wasn't really sure what they had in store for me, but the very first thing they said was, we realized that our car designs suck and are boring. They just said that right off the bat. I was like, well, okay, that took care of most of my questions right there. Um, but they understand that. That's why you see things like Scion, where they're trying new things out. And they're trying to redesign the brands. Like, yes, we realize that it's been boring for the past 10 years. How can we get back to the root of good Toyota cars through new processes? Um, so one of the things they talked about was, I can't remember the name of it, but basically they take funky shapes and they vacuum form them. They create sculptures out of vacuum formed, you know, twigs and flowers and stuff like that. Um, and it's kind of this experimental approach to, okay, well, we've only been looking at market research for the past 10 years and obviously that didn't really work. Right. So how do we do something that's complete opposite, opposite of that, that's more organic? Right. And, you know, they sit next door to the engineers and they, they sit next door to manufacturing people. So they're all integrated into that process. So even if the engineer is like, you know, why are you vacuum forming that flower? You know, they see, oh wait, that creates a cool shape. And they right. developed this fantastic uh, concept car, the Lexus LFLC, which is based off a of vacuum form flower, or at least it is in the video. Um, so, it, so yeah, so I mean, they, 
even even a big corporate company like that is seeing the values of being experimental with design, not just doing the same old, same old. Right. Anything else? Go on, yeah. Go for it. Funnily enough, it's actually this, the same company. So Toyota's doing exactly that. The second thing they said after our cars suck is that we listen too much to consumers. I said, whoa, that seems like a very undesignery thing to say, you know, that the consumers got it wrong. And their point was that consumers focus on the now. They say what I want now. They don't say what I want 10 years from now, five years from now. Um, so that was definitely the one standout. Everyone else I talked to, though, was like, you know, we, we take our clients and take them out to lunch, or we, you know, we invite them in and do a sit down, you know, a research shop with them. So it's definitely far and away the most prominent thing I encountered. Toyota was definitely the one standout that says, you know, we're going to let our designers just be emotional and, you know, vacuum form flowers and see where that goes. And, you know, just consumers will probably like our products, or hopefully. Anything else? Oh, we got some uh, we got some cool tattoos for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you all for having me. Thank you to your awesome club. Thanks, Dave. Great, thank you. Great. All right. Um, next week, July 10th, we have Brian Mitchell of Delta Chop Shop, who will give us a look at the inner workings of his motorcycle shop. At Delta Chop Shop, only American-made parts are used, and if none are available, they're made in the shop. No part of the bike build process is outsourced. The discussion will cover material choices and the processes and challenges associated with assembling all the small pieces that at the end become a finished product. product. No two bikes are ever the same. And to illustrate his talk, Brian will bring in a Delta Chop Shop bike that was built from the ground up. Awesome. All right, thanks again.